All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I am honored to introduce our first Grand Round speaker, Dr. Sean Bala. Dr. Bala is an advanced endoscopist, uh, assistant professor in the Division of Digestive Health and Liver Diseases here at the University of Miami. He completed his medical school training at George Washington University School of Medicine, followed by residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He completed his fellowship training as chief fellow at University of Michigan Medical Center and stayed with them for his advanced endoscopy fellowship. In addition to his duties here at the U, Dr. Bala also serves on the Educational Affairs Committee for the American College of Gastroenterology. He's a renowned researcher with over 10 first author publications with a focus on endoscopic therapies and developments. Today, he'll be discussing advances in therapeutic endos endoscopic ultrasound, EUS, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Sean Bala to Grand Rounds. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and, and Dr. Weiss for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to give Grand Rounds to all of you today. Um, I don't know about researcher, but I, I, I am a, a bigger clinician. And, and today I wanted to um, talk to all of you about uh, advances in, in therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound and um, some of the work here we're doing at University of Miami and some of the new um, uh, progression that has occurred within our field. Um, so let's get started. I have no disclosures. Um, and, uh, you know, endoscopic ultrasound has been around for, for quite some, uh, for a few decades. It was developed in the 1980s with the uh, first radial echo endoscope available in 1982. Um, which kind of allowed for a lot of diagnost diagnostic work. Um, and then in 1992, so a whole decade later, is uh, when the first uh, fine needle aspiration of a pancreatic head mass was done with a, a, a curved linear echo endoscope. So these are the two different echo endoscopes that we have available for us. And you can see on the right side here, um, as, uh, as time has kind of developed, uh, we've gone from being able to biopsy different things over the last couple of decades to now, um, really in the last you know, decade or so, moving into therapeutic EUS. And that's kind of what I wanted to highlight today and go over some of the um, advances within our field. So uh, EUS guided procedures, there are several, and this is kind of what I'm going to go over, over today, depend, you know, depending on how much time we have and go over um, some of the procedures we're capable of. And, and many of you will be familiar with uh, fine needle aspiration and fine needle biopsy, which is what we commonly do, especially for pancreatic head masses. And we'll touch upon uh, drainage of pancreatic fluid collections, post-operative fluid collections, um, different methods we have for biliary and gallbladder drainage with ultrasound, and then um, access and altered anatomy, as well as um, endoscopic gastroenterostomy creation. And finally, if we have a little bit of time, I'll, uh, I'll give you an overview for a celiac plexus block neurolysis, and then um, endohepatology is a new area of growth um, that uh, we have as well in, in EUS. And uh, one of my colleagues at a prior um, Grand Rounds, Dr. Bamed Amari, had spoken about this, so I will not spend too much time on that today. Uh, so let's jump in. Um, so fine needle aspiration and biopsy, you know, these are things that um, have been occurring now for a couple of decades, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, pancreatic masses and cancer is really probably what a lot of you are familiar with. They get referred for an EUS with biopsy, and our, our sensitivity now is up to 95%. For uh, uh, Excuse me one second, Sean. Can you speak directly into the microphone? Because there oh, seems to be some ver variation in the volume. Sure. Is that better? Um, okay, so right. okay. yeah, the, the sensitivity of this is um, uh, between about 95% with a specificity of 100%. And so, um, you know, our risks with this, with acute pancreatitis are, are less than 1%. We can evaluate pancreatic cysts um, and get tissue samples and send that out for analysis. We can do lymph node analysis um, and uh, do biopsies as well as staging for esophagus, gastric, rectal cancers, and really biopsy nodes in the mediastinum as well as uh, the abdomen. Um, and oftentimes that if IR doesn't have a great window for these, if it's located near the GI tract, we can really get a good window. Um, EUS can also be used for um, evaluation of liver lesions and biliary strictures where we can biopsy those. We commonly look at GI uh, tract subepithelial lesions like um, GISTs and uh, lyomyomas and are able to biopsy these. And then retroperitoneal masses is another um, area where we can prevent someone from having to go for an X lap if we're really able to kind of um, get to that site. 
So, um, you know, fine needle aspiration and biopsy is what the, the principles of therapeutic EUS have really been built off of, is being able to access a needle into a different location under endosonographic view. Um, and so procedures have developed off of that, but the big game changer has been uh, the development of lumen opposing metal stents. And this has really simplified uh, therapeutic EUS and really made um, the procedures that we do significantly safer. Um, and kind of more widespread. So this is, you can see the stents below. Um, it's a fully covered metal stent um, that is cautery assisted and it's a one step process. And so the simplification of this process is what's been really beneficial um, in the development of these novel procedures that I'm gonna go through. Um, the stent also is shaped like a dumbbell as you can see in, in the image C, um, which allows for anchoring of the stent and limits stent migration. And this comes in a variety of sizes. And this, you know, these stents have become more readily available, and the development of this technology has been really beneficial. And I think as the years progress and these stents start to get better and better, so will our procedures. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was drainage of pancreatic fluid collections, which is probably where um, a, a lot of you have had some experience with therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound. So as you know, a complication for uh, pancreatitis can be development of a pseudocyst or walled-off necrosis. Um, and what um, can happen is these collections can, you know, often be very problematic for patients. So the first thing is, is not all collections need to be drained. There are a lot of patients that will have resolution but which are the patients that do need drainage? And I think one important takeaway for all of us is that symptomatic fluid collections are the ones that need to be drained. So whether it's causing infection, gastric outlet obstruction, patients have limited oral intake, abdominal pain, biliary obstruction, or development of portal hypertension. Those are things that we really need to look out for. And what we can do is, as you can see in this image, we can take our endoscopic ultrasound probe and use that to deploy one of these lumen opposing metal stents into this collection and allow it to drain. And I'll show you a video a little bit later about this. But with this, the um, technical success rates have gotten very good, up to 98%. And the resolution of pseudocysts um, with this drainage can be up to 93%. And with walled off necrosis, 81%. But with necrosis, we're able to go into this collection and kind of clean it out. So some recent literature uh, about this, which has been showing the use of endoscopic um, evaluation is the attention and extension trials, which came out by the Dutch group, uh, the Dutch pancreatic group. Um, and they looked at endoscopic transmural drainage versus surgical step-up therapy. And they followed these patients initially for six months and then also came up with a recent follow-up study that came out for seven years. And this has really changed the way um, that we endoscopically manage our patients. And I think the big takeaway for all of us is between surgery and endoscopic management, there hasn't been any long-term um, differences in mortality or major complications, but the endoscopic side did show fewer pancreatic cutaneous fistulas and fewer needs for re-interventions. And so this has been kind of a big change in how we manage our complex pancreatitis patients with a real endoscopic approach. The other piece of literature that I want to highlight was also a recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine in terms of timing of this. And so they looked at immediate drainage which uh, versus postponed drainage. And really, we kind of look at a timeline of within four to six weeks of when to try to get to this fluid collection. And what they found is in the group with infected necrosis, immediate drainage was not superior to postponed drainage in preventing complications. And then actually in the postponed group, you can see on the right side, they actually required less necrosectomies and less procedures. So timing is critical, I think, depending on the indications and how the patient is doing. Um, but you know, waiting uh, and not having to rush into this is completely reasonable. So moving on from pancreatic necrosis, I want to move to um, endoscopic ultrasound guided gallbladder drainage. And so, you know, for biliary drainage, the, the thing that we think of and the standard of care is ERCP um, for, uh, for uh, draining the bile duct. But historically, when ERCP fails, we often move to interventional radiology to do a percutaneous uh, drainage. So as you can see, the first image on the right side um, you have a drain going across the liver into um, the duodenum draining the bile duct. Um, EUS, however, can also be a good approach that is beneficial and has high rates of technical success that I'm going to show you today. As you can see in the bottom picture, you have the ultrasound probe followed by 
um, a stent placed directly into the bile duct, allowing for internal drainage. And I think the um, big thing um, that has been shown in, in a lot of studies that are now starting to come out that um, this was a randomized control trial between EUS and ERCP for biliary drainage. And the technical success is pretty good. You know, ERCP, we like to think that we're very skilled, but we're not 100%. And EUS can kind of get us some good uh, technical success rate. I think the big takeaways for endoscopic drainage is that you get to avoid this external drainage catheter, which can be a pain for patients. They also obviously are also connected to an external bag at times, and it can require repeated interventions for those drain exchanges. So looking at a little bit of data, comparing EUS-guided biliary drainage with ERCP, um, when you look at clinical and uh, technical success rates, the rates look pretty similar, which is good. Um, you know, with any procedure, you want to make sure the adverse events rates are low, and they seem pretty similar with um, EUS and ERCP. I think the big takeaways were um, the re-intervention rates being a little bit lower with the EUS group, and the stent patency is another area that I want to highlight, which is a, an added benefit uh, for um, EUS. Now, there's two uh, ways we can access the bile duct, either going directly into the bile duct, which is a cholidoco duodenostomy, or a hepaticogastrostomy, which accesses from the lesser curvature of the stomach into the left hepatic duct. And so I want to highlight one of the cases that um, had been done. Uh, this was a, a case of a patient with a Roux-en-Y hepaticogastrostomy that was actually pregnant, and um, a, a uh, a single balloon enteroscopy would have needed to be done, which would have been a longer, um, less technically uh, successful procedure, um, as well as require a lot more anesthesia and fluoro time. And so this was published in Video GIE as one of the um, novel cases done. And so you can see here, we're getting access into one of the left hepatic ducts into the liver um, with our needle. And as we get access through there, we then are able to um, inject contrast directly into the bile duct. And you can see there's a stricture here between the bile duct and her bowel. And so we use our guide wire to advance a balloon over and we can really dilate that area and treat it. Um, uh, where, whereas having to do this with a balloon enteroscopy would be a lot more challenging. Um, and so this is our balloon dilation that's going into place. Um, and then this is us placing our stents endoscopically. Um, which worked out pretty well. And I'm going to show you a fluoro image here, which kind of captures um, what we did. And so you can see these are the stents that are going from her stomach all the way across into across her bile duct into the jejunum. And we have some metal stents and plastic stents. And so she was able to get through her pregnancy. Um, and then once she delivered her baby safely, we were able to take all these stents out and she did very well. Um, and so this was kind of a, a novel approach to a, to a complicated patient. Um, moving on to post-operative fluid collection. So, you know, um, these can occur in anastomotic leaks. You can develop subphrenic abscesses, hepatic abscesses, biomas, um, and these can be really difficult to target. They can occur after a Whipple, after a ruin y gastric bypass, but really after any surgery. And historically, it's either been take this patient back to the OR or do a percutaneous drain on them. Um, but, you know, if it's close to the GI tract, we should be able to have access. And as you can see in this diagram, this is an example of that. So there's been a couple of studies recently that looked at this. This was in surgical endoscopy this year um, that actually showed 48 patients um, with good technical and clinical success Four of them needed repeat procedures, and two had complications with intracystic bleeding. And in these situations, uh, we still need assistance with IR. Um, and this is another study that was published in GIE in 2020 with 75 patients that showed, again, a very good success rate um, as well. So, you know, I want to highlight this was done by our group here with Dr. Kumar and, and Dr. Amin, and this was a unique case of a transjejunal, so through the jejunum after a Whipple draining an abscess that had occurred. Um, and so postoperatively, this patient had developed abdominal pain and fever, and I'll, and I'll show you some of the work that um, uh, Dr. Kumar and our group was able to do here. And so you can see this large postoperative fluid collection that's developed um, and really no great access site for IR. And so endoscopic drainage is what we uh, proceeded to do. And you can see this big collection, um, which is adjacent to actually the portal vein, which is lighting up there. And um, you know, we able, were able to get needle access and uh, send this fluid off for culture um, and tailor the patient's antibiotics based on the fluid that um, we had 
uh, returned. And then you can see here our lumen opposing metal stent being deployed and it's being pulled back um, into the correct position across the jejunum into um, that collection. And what you'll see here in a second is kind of one of my favorite parts of uh, therapeutic endoscopy was all this pus draining. And so, you know, that's a good sign of, of clinical success for us. This patient ended up doing um, well after this drainage. We left this set in place and were able to uh, remove it um, after several weeks. So now I want to turn to um, endoscopic ultrasound guided gallbladder drainage. And so, you know, building off of these same principles, this can be a good option for patients that are poor surgical candidates. Um, and so the drainage of the gallbladder can be done either from the bulb or the gastric antrum. Um, the, the good part about this is you have low rates of recurrent cholecystitis, which can occur with percutaneous biliary drainage. Um, since there is no external um, catheter, there's less post-procedural pain and lower risk of adverse events and re-interventions. And so in this diagram, you can see um, you have your gallbladder um, followed by a lumen opposing metal stent kind of getting drainage directly into the duodenum. The other option we can do via ERCP is put a stent that goes all the way across into the gallbladder, but that can be very technically difficult. Um, looking at several case series that have been published on this, you know, technical success rate is very good, almost above 90% um, with, um, you know, with, with some procedure related um, side effects of pain, bleeding and perforation, but those rates are, are relatively low. And there was this huge meta analysis, which was published um, earlier last year, actually of 1200 patients that kind of compared these studies of um, percutaneous drainage versus ERCP drainage versus EUS drainage. And I think the big takeaways here is that um, IR guided or EUS guided gallbladder drainage have the highest technical and clinical success. EUS out of the entire group had the lowest rate of recurrent cholecystitis, which I think is key. But IR actually had high risks of re-intervention and unplanned readmission. And I think that you know, can be very problematic for patients. The takeaway from this is every procedure has its advantage and disadvantage. And between these three, um, selecting the technique based on expertise and patient preferences is, is very critical. Um, this is another uh, group of um, different papers that have come out um, looking at EUS versus percutaneous drainage. And as you can see, the technical and clinical success rates are, are, are both excellent with groups, but the adverse events are um, relatively similar in both groups. Um, and so I want to provide you here with an example of what this looks like. And so this is a case that I had done of uh, endoscopic gallbladder drainage. And so you can see the gallbladder here on the left side of your screen with some sludge. This was a patient with malignant bili um, with a malignant uh, malignancy, a palliative patient that presented with pain and fevers. And you can see those stones that just flew across the screen there. And so here we are trying to find a nice window to kind of get into this gallbladder. Um, and you'll see me puncture into the gallbladder really nicely um, and be able to deploy our stent and get good drainage here in a second. There you go. And uh, we kind of will open up the stent and be able to create um, a connection between the gallbladder, and in this case, the antrum of the stomach to allow the gallbladder to drain directly. So that's our stent opening up. And let's fast forward here. So you'll see some fluid draining out. Um, from the stent, which is what we like to see, and we're peering into the gallbladder there. And uh, we're opening up the stent with a little bit of a balloon dilation. And uh, soon after that, you'll be able to see kind of one of my favorite parts of this, which is a gallstone that's appeared. And um, in this case, we kind of left this um, and went back and, you know, you can clean out the gallbladder in the future and remove those stones if necessary. But this was a, a great case of, you know, being able to avoid a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube and in someone that was a poor surgical candidate. And, um, you know, this case worked out very well for, for us and for the patient. Um, so moving on to um, access and altered anatomy. So Roux and Y gastric bypass patients can be very difficult for us to deal with endoscopically when they have either ampullary disease, need an ERCP, or need an EUS. So the gate and the edge procedure have actually been created. And so that, you know, prior to this, the alternatives were either a laparoscopic assisted. So you take the patient to the OR, you put a port into their excluded stomach, and then you are able to do an ERCP. Now, those are, that's invasive. The complication rates are higher. They have found increased length of hospital stay and increased cost, which I'll show you. 
The other option is a very time uh, consuming double balloon enteroscopy, which is basically waving your way all the way around that maze of getting through that difficult anatomy. And then once you get to the papilla, really then trying to get biliary access. And you know the tools that we have are very limited to do that. And you know because of that, the technical success rates with you know, balloon enteroscopy is at best 65%. So in comes the, uh, the edge or the gate procedure. And as you can see here, um, what this allows us to do is essentially do an endoscopic reversal of the gastric bypass. So we use endoscopic ultrasound to basically puncture from the um, gastric pouch into the excluded stomach. And that um, creates this connection, which allows us to do a traditional kind of ERCP or EUS with a more normal anatomy. Now, obviously when you create this connection, there's a risk of developing a fistula and some weight gain, but the studies have shown that this isn't um, too bad. So this is actually a paper that was published in 2021. 13 centers looked at 178 patients to see if this is technically possible, a 98% technical success rate with 2% severe adverse events. Um, a small number of patients had fistulas, but these were treated endoscopically, and a very small number of patients had weight gain. This is another procedure or another a study comparing um, this EDGE procedure to laparoscopic assisted ERCP. Um, no difference in technical and clinical success rates, no difference in adverse events, but the big takeaway is procedure time was significantly lower and hospital length of stay was also lower in the group that was done endoscopically. And I think, you know, that is very promising as we continue to develop these procedures. So this is um, a, a, a case report that we have um, in publication that's submitted. Um, that I want to show you, which actually combines um, same day drainage of a pancreatic pseudocyst. So this was a large pseudocyst in a patient that developed um, after pancreatitis and, you know, she has a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Um, we weren't able to find a safe window to drain this collection. As you can see, there's large blood vessels in the way. And so that way we decided to do what's called the gate procedure. So this is actually the ultrasound of her excluded stomach. Um, as you can see. And so we're puncturing from her gastric pouch into the excluded stomach. And now we're filling up contrast and fluid into this side under ultrasound and x-ray to see this. You're going to see our aluminum posing metal stent get deployed, which is essentially going to allow us to create this connection between her pouch to the excluded stomach. So now that the stent is in place, we're gonna see it deploy and we're able to now have this connection going from the pouch into the stomach. So we've reversed her gastric bypass. We're gonna drive our endoscope, the ultrasound scope through here. And as you can see, we're going nicely through that stent being careful not to dislodge it. And now we have better access to this pancreatic pseudocyst with no blood vessels in the way. So the patient was quite symptomatic. So we did this all in one step. And here we're deploying a second lumen opposing metal stent to now drain this pancreatic fluid collection into the excluded stomach. And so again, this is one of my favorite parts is when you see fluid coming back at you, you know you're in the right spot, you've gotten good drainage and the patient actually felt immediate relief um, in recovery after this. And, and you know she really did well. And so we came back in a few weeks later, took these stents out, no fistula development, no weight gain, and she, she did really well. Um, so the last um, uh, major procedure that I wanna focus on is EUS-guided gastroenterostomy. So this is um, using endoscopic ultrasound to basically create an endoscopic bypass of the distal stomach and proximal duodenum. And we do this for patients with gastric outlet obstruction and patients with duodenal or pancreatic adenocarcinoma. You know, the, the traditional and more uh, uh, approach is the enteral stent, so the duodenal stent. Um, and that I will show you has its downsides. And this is in patients with poor surgical, that are poor surgical candidates. Um, and, uh, you know, the big thing about this is it's one of our most technical procedures. As you can see here, we basically are creating this connection between the stomach and the small bowel. So looking at a couple of studies, um, this was published in GIE of this year, um, looked at duodenal stent and endoscopic um, gastroenterostomy. And I think the big takeaways are um, adverse events were similar. Uh, clinical success was higher in um, the gastroenterostomy group. And then th at three month follow-up stent patency um, was, uh, was better. And I think this is an issue in our patients with pancreatic cancer or, um, or malignancies that those stents start to close up. Um, another um, study looking at enteral stents 
um, actually showed that the need for repeat intervention in the duodenal stent group was higher. So um, this uh, was a retrospective um, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that actually looked at um, uh, gastroenterostomy versus duodenal stent versus surgical gastrojejunostomy. And when you compare um, all these, uh, these studies, what they actually found is between the enterostomy and the stent, the enterostomy group did better with clinical success. In terms of technical success when looking at the gastrojejunostomy surgically, versus EUS guided, the surgeons did better in terms of technical success. However, the clinical success and adverse events were similar in both groups. However, the length of stay in the hospital was significantly shorter. Again, these are very sick patients with malignant obstruction and that are on palliation. I think getting them out of the hospital for a better quality of life is, I think, a big important part, which is what this procedure can do. So this is a video um, by my colleague, Dr. Amin, of uh, one of our EUS guided gastroenterostomy procedures. So we're putting a guide wire down here into the jejunum and we're gonna follow that up with a, um, our nasobiliary tube. And so this nasobiliary tube goes down into the jejunum and basically allows us to fill the distal bowel with a combination of methylene blue, saline and contrast. Um, and what that does is it creates a window for us. And as you can tell, it's kind of sensing a pattern here is we need a pocket to get into. And so this uh, jejunum is filled really nicely. Uh, we puncture with, an, um, with our stent. And as you can see, our stent is gonna deploy and we're gonna get that into a very nice position here. Um, and once we have that in position, you can see it opening up endoscopically and we see blue um, from our methylene blue, which means we've made an excellent creation between the stomach and our jejunum, essentially creating an endoscopic bypass. Um, and this you know, patient did uh, very well after this procedure. I'll highlight to you here our upper GI series that we got the following day and when you look at this, you can see the contrast draining through our stent into the distal um, duodenum slash jejunum, kind of bypassing the traditional anatomy over here. And, and the patients are able to eat. Um, and, you know, for them, from a quality of life perspective, this is huge. And so... Um, uh, really One more minute. One more sure. minute. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this and we'll go on to uh, just my uh, takeaways. You know, celiac plexus block and endohepatology are also areas of growth. We're also able to coil gastric varices. Um, but what I want you guys, all of you to take home is that there's a wide range of clinical applications for therapeutic EUS and it's only growing. It's an invasive um, way of doing procedures. Um, it's a great option for poor surgical candidates. As of now, I think the future is really bright for this field. You know, we've come a long way in the last 40 years. What's going to happen in the next 40s, I think, going to be really um, important. Safe and high rates of technical and clinical success. Always have to talk about risk versus benefit with patients and patient preference. Um, the future is promising with development of new techniques and equipment. Um, and I think it requires expertise at, at a tertiary care center. And I want to highlight that we have this expertise here. All these procedures that I highlighted today were done by either myself or my colleagues, and we're all capable of doing that within our advanced group here at UM. Creative problem solving is the name of the game, I think, in endoscopy and in GI. And so if you have patients in need, please call us. We're always willing help. Um, and uh, here are my references. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for that little crash course, but um, I'm always here to help. That's my email, and my phone number. Please call anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bayo. That was a, a very interesting presentation and uh, shows that you can get pretty much any, get your scope almost anywhere. And that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, who do you train in this? Is it primarily the GI fellows that do a separate year of interventional, or do our uh, GI fellows now are generally trained in this area as well? Yeah, so our, our, our general fellows, you know, do get um, training in terms of being able to watch and experience these procedures, but, you know, EUS is one of those um, predominantly done in the fourth year. And I think you have to have a high level of EUS diagnostic skills before moving on to therapeutic EUS because of the technical difficulties. So a lot of the hands-on training is really reserved for our advanced endoscopy fellow um, in, in kind of the skill set. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, please ask them on the chat. We'll now go back to Dr. Rodriguez, our chief, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Bala. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. It's my honor to introduce our second grand, grand round speaker, Dr. Abigail Koch. Dr. Koch is an assistant professor of clinical medicine here at the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She completed her medical school training at University of South Florida and completed her residency training at Wake Forest. She then went to Johns Hopkins where she not only completed her pulmonary and critical care fellowship, but also received her Master of Health Science degree in clinical investigation. Dr. Koch has an extensive research background, including peer reviewed publications, book chapters, NIH grants, investigating COPD morbidity and mortality, to name a few. She has served as the Director of Clinical Operations for the Pulmonary Section at the Miami VA, including the Directorship of the Pulmonary Function Lab and the Pulmonary Rehab Program. Today, she'll be discussing the updates on immune checkpoint inhibitor pneumonitis, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Coach to Grand Rounds. Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Just let me know in the chat if there's any mic issues with uh, my microphone as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, again, my name is Abby Koch, and uh, I'm assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine here at the University of Miami. I have no disclosures. Uh, and as they said, uh, we're, we're going to talk today about immune checkpoint inhibitor pneumonitis. All right, so the objectives of the talk are to understand the associations between immunotherapy and pneumonitis, to understand current knowledge of chronic immune checkpoint and inhibitor pneumonitis, and to think about future directions and prevention and early identification of ICI pneumonitis. So the good news is lung cancer survival has increased, right? We're doing better. We're doing better for multiple reasons. Among them are increased smoking cessation, lung cancer screening programs, which lead to early detection and advanced treatment options. And so I just wanna take a minute, a shameless plug to start off with the entire Department of Medicine to say lung cancer screening is important and it works. And so here's the guidelines, the criteria that you should look for in any patient that you, should, that you see to refer them to our lung cancer screening program. Uh, age 50 to 80, 20 pack year smoking history, current smoker or quit in the last 15 years. And so our program here, um, there's a referral in Epic that you can use to get them into the program. Our team will talk about shared decision-making and risk factors associated with screening, smoking cessation, and follow them to make sure that they get the needed scans and the, um, the follow-up uh, based on those scans that they need. Uh, as a second part of this, we've also developed, since I've come on to the university here, a pulmonary nodule program for incidentally found pulmonary nodules, um, so that something shows up in the ER, somebody gets an inpatient scan of their abdomen, you see a little nodule that needs some follow-up, please send them to the pulmonary clinic. So those are my shameless plugs for my uh, new uh, screening program, and uh, we, we hope to get a lot of referrals to that. But the main point of this talk is these treatment options and the advanced therapies that we're seeing, and that's the field of immunotherapy. It has really changed cancer treatment since I've been in training. We've seen the development of all these new drugs. You can see here, uh, these are the FDA approved indications for immunotherapies. And every time I give this talk, I have to check all the labels to see all the new updated indications because it's just constant. You know, I used to work at the FDA, and while I was there, we get weekly emails of all the new approvals, and unless you get that, it's really hard to keep up, uh, but you'll see even uh, at the top, pembrolizumab, we're starting to see tumor agnostic approvals, so even if you just have a high tumor mutational burden or mycosatellite instability, high mismatch repair, there's other indications, and they're just coming more and more popular uh, for treatment of different types of cancer, uh, and the outcomes are are very significantly improved. Uh, but along with this comes these sort of immune-related adverse events that we're going to talk about. Uh, this is a Department of Medicine talk, so I think most of you here have probably seen some of these uh, IRAEs, we call them. It can affect any uh, organ system from the eyes, brain, lungs, heart, um, blood, you know, your um, hematologic systems, your skin, um, 
and then joints and muscles as well. So, so usually these are multidisciplinary approaches to care in these patients. Um, and it has sort of made the oncologist even more of a jack of all trades because they're the ones that are diagnosing these and finding these things related to therapies. Uh, but I'm a pulmonologist. So today we're gonna talk about pneumonitis. I'm gonna focus on that. This is a representative slide of a case of pneumonitis, just to kind of get you thinking about the things that you might see in a CAT scan when you're taking care of a patient that is on immunotherapy and has developed pneumonitis. The difficult part and why pulmonology is all, all, always involved is because the diagnosis is important, right? We wanna make sure we're not missing something else and just blaming the drug because it really is a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you're seeing these patients in, a, in an acute setting where they're short of breath, um, oftentimes we start with a, a CAT scan of the chest. And if you see something concerning for pneumonitis, you would wanna rule out an infection. So if they're making sputum that they can expectorate, send a sputum culture, uh, bronchoscopy with BAL if able, if they're, safe, if they're safe enough and not on too high amounts of oxygen, you have a protected airway where you can get a BAL sample to really rule out infection. There's been studies done, um, published in a small case series um, of patients that did have BAL in the setting of pneumonitis, and there's known to be a lymphocytic predominance in the cell count of the BAL. So that's something we look for, but it's not necessarily specific to this disease. It's not pathognomonic of the disease. And so it just gives us a little indication, but we have to take the full clinical picture. We used to do transbronchial biopsies to get a piece of tissue. It's not necessarily required and it's kind of fallen out of favor because it really wasn't adding to our diagnosis. Again, there was nothing pathognomonic that was coming out about it. What we did learn is that the common patterns are cellular interstitial pneumonia, organizing pneumonia, and diffuse alveolar damage. When you think about the whole clinical picture, once you have that those pieces of information, you've ruled out infection, again, you think about different things that might be helpful. And these were sort of some of the things that were hypothesized early on in the field. And what we found is that the useful, the useful things that you'll see um, on the first column, uh, multidisciplinary adjudication. So we really think that a consistent team of people coming together to use a systematic criteria to identify and diagnose these things adds value to a consistent diagnosis, because I think that's where we fall apart a lot. And having people from different subspecialties weighing in and saying, well, in, in our area of inflammatory arthritis, this is what we see, maybe in the lung, we should look at this. And that group together, I think really will work to advance the field uh, and to diagnose these things sooner. Uh, as I mentioned, we know that BAL lymphocytosis, decreased neutrophils, lack of eosinophils and negative cultures are what we're looking for on the BAL. You might have increased risk of having pneumonitis if you've had recent exposure to chemotherapy or radiation therapy. That one's kind of a question mark because there's some conflicting studies on that, but I think it makes sense. Uh, some of the times where our studies are lacking is just because it's a small number of patients that we've included. Um, you rule out heart failure, rule out other lung diseases. The things that are not particularly useful, and this is where we kind of, uh, I want to just educate everybody. So the time to onset of symptoms, there's a, there's a median of three months, but oftentimes it's longer than that. So don't say, oh, it can't be this because we didn't see it right after we started therapy. It can still be it. And I'll show you some data on that in a little bit. The radiographic appearance is oftentimes confused with an infection. It doesn't look much different. There's consolidations, there's ground glass, and that's why having a, a team that looks at these all the time is very important. Uh, the specific agent, pembrolizumab versus durvalumab, it doesn't really, it hasn't come to light yet that there's a difference in the way it presents or how it should be treated. Right now, we know there may be a slight increase if it's a PD-1 inhibitor versus a PDL one CTLA-4. We don't have a lot of definition but the differences between them. I think most of that's because we um, often see patients treated on a combination or one after the other. And so it's the retrospective studies have been difficult to tease out that information. Having other immune-related offense doesn't need to necessarily predict pneumonitis. And then whether or not your tumor responded or not does not predict the event of pneumonitis. Here's the grading score. If you've worked in this uh, field before, you see these for your organ system, you're probably aware of this. It goes anywhere from grade one to grade 
five. So grade one is asymptomatic, grade five is death, and everywhere in between. And so the treatment algorithms are based on these differences. So I'm going to just talk about the what we know about the incident. So checkpoint inhibitor pneumonitis is documented in zero to 10% in clinical trials. But then when we look at real world data, which is typically collected in, in centers that are looking for this disease, you see about a 13 to 19% incidence of checkpoint inhibitor pneumonitis. Uh, there's there's a, a well sort of established idea that people in clinical trials underreport their symptoms um, and because they're usually desperate for the drug and they don't want to be taken off of it because the rechallenge doesn't exist in clinical trials. Whereas in the real world, a lot of times we'll treat them and they may be able to try the drug again and, and get the therapeutic benefit from the drug for the tumor. Uh, and so, so there is a disconnect in the, re the reporting of incidents there, but I think in the real world, probably 20% is a reasonable estimate. Again, time to onset is usually about three months. But you can see some data here that I'm showing um, out of the Hopkins group and their um, checkpoint inhibitor database that they're seeing some early, early development of the stage four disease, but stage two disease where they're just maybe starting to be symptomatic, not necessarily on oxygen, um, that might happen as many as a thousand days out. And so just because it happened later does not mean it is not truly in pneumonitis, and we need to pay attention to that. I think, again, prospective studies will really help tease out who happens when, uh, and we can learn from that. So the risk factors that we know, as I said, the PD-1 is a little bit more than the PD-L1 for getting pneumonitis. If you haven't had treatment, if you have non-small cell lung cancer, uh, so risk for getting it is the histology non-adenocarcinoma. Um, you'll see later mortality is increased in adenocarcinoma, so a little bit uh, different there. Um, higher tumor burden is a risk factor and pre-existing lung disease. And initially we thought just ILD, but now studies are showing that even with COPD and asthma, you're seeing an increased incidence here. And so thinking about that of, do we not give them the therapy? Do we pre-treat them with something? Where's this field going in those people with lung disease? And that's who I typically see in my clinic and, and ask for assessments for how do we go forward here. Uh, but again, unfortunately, in those that get it, the mortality is about 12 to 18 percent. So let's talk about the, in, the um, radiologic findings. As I said, they're pretty nonspecific, and that's why an organized group of people evaluating the cases every time is important. Um, again, these are small case series, 20 patients, 27 patients. That's kind of the level of data that we're at um, and, and that we're basing our decisions on because the field is relatively new in people that are studying these true adverse events. Um, but commonly, you'll see a organizing pneumonia pattern or ground glass opacities. And if you see in the Venn diagram here, um, you know, the larger circles are consolidation and ground glass opacity. So you can see why many people would think this is an infection and just keep treating with more and more and more antibiotics and, and not getting anywhere. Um, there will be some septal thickening, some interstitial changes, some traction bronchiectasis. It goes more with a true interstitial lung disease picture, uh, but that is not the majority of cases in these case series. So again, these are just some representative images. Uh, this first one over here um, at the top is a, a mild pattern of an NSIP, a sort of interstitial changes in the periphery of the lung. You might see this in somebody that is still early, minimal symptoms or asymptomatic. You got a surveillance scan and you start to see it, it might indicate that you're gonna look a little bit closer. But then it goes all the way to the next where you see a full uh, organizing pneumonia pattern or at the bottom here where we have a sort of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, acute interstitial pneumonia picture. So just a very different amount of changes in the lungs and it's not necessarily indicative of, of the symptoms and how they're going to present. What we do know, so this, this one slide is our, our treatment algorithm, right? So everybody gets steroids. As long as you have a symptom, you get steroids. Uh, and the, you know, the guidelines are saying to give a pretty high dose. I think in practice, sometimes we give a smaller dose on smaller uh, people with less symptoms, but, but uh, the overall we hold the drug. 
Um, we give steroids, and then in, as long as it's not severe disease, we will consider a rechallenge once they get better from, from the pneumonitis. Um, you'll see in grade three and four here that you might add an additional, an additional immunosuppressive agent. Um, and here's where we kind of want to think about that. So if you're not getting a response from a high dose of steroid in the first 72 hours, you want to start thinking about the next agent. Uh, and so what I do um, is typically um, think about IVIG or Cellcept in pulmonary, in pneumonitis. So uh, the concerns about IVIG is that it's an infusion. Um, sometimes it's more difficult to orchestrate where Cellcept is easier to give, but might have a slower onset of action. And, and there is a sort of a risk of lymphoproliferative disorder development. And so you wanna think about that in your patient as well. Um, some use of infliximab has been seen with um, sort of more of the colitis and GI um, things with, and as well as inflammatory arthritis, not as much in pneumonitis, but there are ongoing trials head to head in these therapies to see how the response goes. However, you could imagine that the uh, recruitment is a little bit slow because these are rare occurrences overall. Um, and so refractory pneumonitis treatment might take four to five months of therapy to see an improvement. Um, and so we continue to do these second uh, additional immunosuppressive agents in that, in that realm. But then there's a new entity that we're kind of looking at thinking about chronic pneumonitis. And so this is any time where you're off, a, off the immune checkpoint inhibitor on immunosuppression for greater than 12 weeks is your chronic pneumonitis. And interestingly, what we see is as you try to taper, usually you taper the steroid off over four to six weeks and you hit that six week mark, you get down to about 10 of prednisone and they'll, they'll be looking good, no symptoms, Im imaging is better. And then you stop the prednisone and they flare back up. And it really is interesting because it comes back in the same exact place, the same exact pattern on the CT scan is, is what we're seeing. And again, these are small case series. There was a, a study out of Hopkins that looked at 300 patients, um, 44 developed pneumonitis, but only six of them became chronic and three of them got better. Six of them remained chronic, chronic forever. Um, and so those six, uh, five were non-small cell lung cancer. One was melanoma. So it seems to be uh, more common in, in a lung cancer population, but again, very small numbers. Um, so the histology on those when they did have biopsies was organizing pneumonia, again, kind of similar to one of the radiologic findings that we're seeing. So I think the field itself, uh, we now know, you know, kind of more about the person this happens in. We know we don't want to take this therapy away from people. And now our goal, uh, my goal as a pulmonologist is worked very closely with the oncologist to work on prevention and early identification of not only those at risk, but of disease. And so historically, I would see people in the hospital that are on high flow oxygen and, and it's already kind of, you know, past the point where we get a lot of bang for our buck with the steroids. But if we identify them earlier, maybe a smaller dose of prednisone would work. Um, and so we, we think about identifying comorbidities. We know lung disease, smoking, age, BMI, and functional status are good indicators. Um, but what's more, is there something else predictive? Is there a lung function parameter like uh, FEV1 or DLCO that could uh, show if that's decreased at baseline, that you're, you're at to this level, are you more, um, you're more inclined to get it? And so far, the studies have not, most of studies that have been done have been retrospective and do not have serial lung function uh, collected that they could use to even understand this outcome. I think we all recognize this fatal uh, toxicity and are very interested now. And so more and more of the trials and clinical trials are including this uh, and looking at this information. Um, we also want to look at biomarkers. So there's been work in the field looking at biomarkers, uh, blood counts, cytokines, and proteins. So the promising blood counts that we've seen now is, is sort of a ratio. So it's lymphocyte neutrophil ratio, platelet lymphocyte ratio, and eosinophils. And so those are the things that are kind of trying to start to be predictive. Um, but again, in these studies, they're looking at any toxicity ever, and it's not specific to pneumonitis. So I, I want to bring up an important point there that 
working together in a multidisciplinary group where you're um, collecting these data on anybody that gets any toxicity and understanding how that nuance is different will be helpful because the oncologist is seeing these patients and I have to predict any type of organ system involvement in a toxicity. And so if we can try to work on a panel uh, that brings everything together that says, this is what we follow if you're on this therapy to avoid risks or understand and predict risks in those patients. Same thing with cytokines. We're looking at basically all the inflammatory cytokines. We've got, you know, IL-6 through IL-17 um, that are showing some, some promise, but again, very non-specific. So if we could identify a panel um, that could predict uh, some or most of these it's complications. Uh, proteins that are showing promise, uh, albumin, CRP, um, CXCL5, the chemokines are, are kind of showing some progress, but these are all still in very early trials and, and small um, studies. So I think where we need to go with biomarkers is a prospective collecting data study from time of diagnosis before diagnosis, right? In my nodule clinic, I can get these people early, I get a diagnosis and we follow them. And I think it's that early of an indicator that we need to really understand what's going on in the patient as a whole. Uh, we're looking at genetics as well. So HLA genotyping, microRNA, gene expression profiles, we're starting to see some SNPs that are indicated of protective and uh, risk factors. And so genetics is going to be a new forefront. We've seen some changes, um, you know, more women getting pneumonitis than men in some small reports. Um, there has not been anything in racial diversity differences in um, backgrounds or genetic race uh, has not been studied. So I think those are kind of ripe for investigation and places where we could look. So summary and future considerations, you know, it's a very early field in managing the side effects, right? We know now that the drugs are doing great things to treat the tumor. Um, there's more and more every day. We have all these, these new approvals coming through. Now they're being used in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. They're on maintenance therapy for, for a long time, being chronically exposed to these medications, changing to another one if one doesn't respond. And so these complications are going to continue to occur. And so I think we need to develop a systematic approach to diagnose early, treat in a consistent manner. And then we really need to move University of Miami into the forefront to be uh, a player in this game and collecting the data uh, in a thoughtful manner in a multidisciplinary way to kind of get these biomarkers and, and indications for where you might see risk and, and think about different treatment options with less immunosuppression and again, pre-treatment options. So if you're at risk, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, information in auto autoimmune antibodies in the field of um, the arthritis is. And I think, you know, thinking about something like that in the pneumonitis realm, we just haven't gotten there yet, but we could go in that direction next. And so I think it's an exciting time to be part of this. Um, I don't, it, the, the studies are small. And so I think we can contribute a lot to the field. Uh, that is my talk. I just wanted to give you a latest update on everything as it's coming down the pike, but I'll take any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Koch. That was a really wonderful, clear presentation of an important topic. Let me begin by asking, is there, are there any data that look at associations of complications? That is, we, you're looking at the lung specifically in pneumonitis, but for example, is there an association of pneumonitis and thyroiditis or adrenalitis or some other itis that uh, could help us better understand um, mechanism of action and what tissues are more likely to be affected? Epithelial tissues for some, uh, mesenchymal tissues for others, uh, any insight there? Yeah, so so far it is there is no uh, pattern of co-occurrence, and one does not predict the other. I think uh, as you as you point out, it likely is based on the uh, the patient substrate that this is who they are, and they may be more at risk for these different things in different cell types. So far, there has been no information on this. I think it's largely due to the fact that it's mostly retrospective studies that are looking at the information that we had. And so if we start to think about 
looking at the patient as a whole and their genetic makeup, as well as we also have to think about the tumor makeup, right? Because as the treatment happens, the tumor my, you know, microenvironment changes and may have different mutations that's really set this up. And so I think the the advances in most of these, as I kind of alluded, were in the autoantibodies and autoimmune diseases where they see them starting to develop as this goes along. And, and was it that the patient was maybe a setup to have autoimmune disease in the future and didn't get lupus yet, but then started down this path with this PD-1 inhibitor and is starting to display lupus now. And so we we really are changing the immune system of, of the person. And so it makes sense that they would have multiple, but but no literature currently on on what the common ones are. Good idea as you collect your biobank to include that sort of information as well. It'd be so great uh, to have it all at the same time. Dr. Yeah. Dickey, did you want to ask a question? Unmute yourself. Well, let me read his question for you then. If there's any suggestion of interaction with intercurrent viral respiratory tract infections making it worse? Yeah, so it's a good thought. And I think that's what we're, you know, we're always looking for with a BAL sample to really truly get the, vi the viral, um, you know, know if there's a viral infection that we can identify during that time. Um, not reported previously. And I think it adds a really, important complication for treating with a boatload of steroids, right? So then we have to think about another way to treat and, it, and it's an important point, but but no, um, nothing known yet, but good thought. Okay, well, I thank both our speakers today for really stimulating Grand Rounds. Please check the uh, chat for the link to this M uh, MOC and CME credit. And I'll look forward to seeing everybody next week, if not before. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.